Hi, this is Amanda. And this is Lindsay. We're True Creeps. Where the stories are true. And the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore. To the possibly plausible paranormal. To horrifying history. To tense and terrible true crime. And everything else that goes bump in the night. We want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, and welcome to our first episode of True Crime Digest. We are very excited about this. Right? Well, what we were thinking is all of the true crime stories that we've told you about already, some of them have updates. And instead of just doing little itty bitty update episodes, we thought it would be kind of fun to make an episode of updates of things that we've covered before. And we're hoping to do it monthly and sometimes even include some true crime news. Yeah. And I think, too, one of the things that we're going to talk about today, we talked about the Cecil Hotel, but we didn't talk at great length about Elisa Lamps. So if there's like a case that is widely known, there might not be an episode on it. But also, if there's a case that you're really interested in, feel free to share it with us and maybe we'll make it a full episode and then continue doing updates on it. So let us know. Yeah. You know how to reach us. TrueCreepsPod at gmail.com. All the socials. They all <laughs> exist. And if you like what you're hearing, please feel free to leave us a review, rate us on iTunes, leave us a review on Facebook. If you do any of these things, screenshot it and email it to us and we'd be happy to send you a sticker. Send it to us via email to truecreepspod at gmail.com and we'll get you a sticker sent out. Yeah, we're so excited. We are also going to have some exciting news next week. I'm not going to give you too many spoilers, but we're very, very excited about something we're going to introduce next week. And we're also going to have more exciting news at the end of the month. We have a lot going on. Yeah, everything's coming. Everything's moving. We're going. We're going. We're doing this. Full podcast team ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and let's start our update episode then. So Lindsay already mentioned it slightly, but Alyssa Lamb update. In our Hotels That Kill episode, we talked about the Cecil Hotel, and we did touch on one of the biggest mysteries of the hotel, and that was Alyssa Lamb. Well, Netflix had a documentary come out this last month called Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. You guys, uh, you might hear a familiar voice in there. Yes. So I was on another podcast before this. <gasps> I was not your first. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and they chose a couple of clips of my voice and put it in the documentary, which I was so excited about when watching it. Yeah. I did not expect it. And I'm like, oh, hey, that's me. And I've been getting emails and texts from family and friends like, I didn't know you were in this. And I'm like, neither did I. <laughs> that's so exciting. <laughs> kind of exciting. Yeah. I also thought that it was like pretty well done. Like generally, I finished it earlier today. I was like, hmm. I like this. I had mixed feelings for it. So like, I like that they got some of the employees to come back and talk about the incident. But also, I feel like it was a little, I don't want to say like one sided, but I want to say one sided because many people still speculate that there is something being hidden and they were pushing a certain agenda in a certain fashion to make you feel a certain way. Yeah, it was very hotel employee centric. It was. I also loved that they had a person who ran a Facebook group on it because it just shows to show you that there was a time when if you were the person who was like chatting online about a mystery, you were thought of as kind of strange. And now you're part of the documentary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I'm in that group actually, too. And all of those people that spoke that were actually featured in the documentary, a lot of their posts are still like in these groups and still have their YouTube channels out. It's fascinating. I know when I was doing the research, I had watched everything. Thing. I had been following that specific case since it happened. I can remember the day that the elevator video came out. I could tell you what I was doing. It is probably one of my favorite mysteries of all time. And I was very stoked that a little snippet, like I'm not going to say I was in it very much. It's like seven seconds of audio, nothing crazy. But I was like, it's so cool. Yeah, I, I didn't know nearly as much about this as Amanda did. But I thought there was like some interesting tidbits that I didn't know before. Like for the elevator video, you could see like the tip of someone's shoe that doesn't look like it's hers. And I was like, oh, goodness. Yeah, there are people that went frame by frame to describe that video. Fascinating. And try to remake kind of the video to see if they could make the same movements in the same fashion that she did. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of YouTube out there. And also, we didn't cover this when we talked about the Cecil Hotel. And I didn't see this. But I thought that the Cecil Hotel was now the stay on Main. I did not realize that they are existing together in the same building and that the stay on Main is just a few floors of the Cecil Hotel. And then they made like a separate lobby 
because there had been so many bad things that happened and they were like let's rebrand we've got we've got to rebrand we've got to change the color of like the sheets and have new people in the lobby with different uniforms so people don't think the same thing but I guess we're going to keep the elevators. Right. Yeah, it's it's very odd. And again, like they're still working on it right now. Yeah. Some people ever since the documentary came out have visited. And the last post that I saw, someone took a picture like was physically there and saw that they put up where you can't look inside, like into the windows, because now they're working on the bottom floor is my guess. Hmm. I don't know. But they're changing things around. They're working on it. People are saying they're seeing workers going in and out to basically rebrand again. I don't know what they're exactly doing. We'll see. So in the documentary, though, one of the biggest questions that was on everyone's mind was, was the water tank she was found in open or closed when she was found? Because there was some differing data out there from various different places. And Santiago Lopez, the employee that actually found her, was interviewed and says he found her with the lid open. And then the police, I want to say it's in like an interview, had mentioned it was closed when they got there. And the reason it was closed when they got there, Santiago says that he closed it. Also, Santiago breaks my heart because he is very clearly traumatized. You you can see it in his facial expressions and when he talks that he is haunted by what he saw. Yeah. Well, a lot of people were happy to see him, but some people were very upset, wanting to know why. Like, why would you close the lid? And some people were pointing at him saying he has something to hide. And I'm like, I I mean, anything is possible, but I don't get that vibe. Another thing, though, and this is what has always bothered me about this, is if it was indeed open, right? He found it open. And I believe his statement from when it happened had said it was open, too. And it was just confusing based off of what the police were saying, right? But if it was indeed open, I would think as a hotel where all of your water supply that people are drinking and showering and brushing their teeth in comes from the roof, right? Wouldn't that be some sort of like daily checklist to make sure that the hatches are closed so that bird poop and bats and who knows what else, rainwater, all of that doesn't infect your entire hotel? Yeah. And I just hate that that's not a thing that they check every day. I'm very passionate about it. No, and that completely makes sense. When you talk about like older cases in true crime, it's not altogether unusual for a woman's body to be covered up if she's nude. And he was an older gentleman, not like 90, but he was older. I could very much see him having closed it like she's naked. Respect. Yes. Like he's closing it out of respect for her, not even thinking like something's happening. He's just like, oh, this is a woman and she's naked. He just closes it and doesn't even think like, oh, no. Or, you know, you've just experienced great trauma. Most of us won't see a dead body in our lifetimes that's not in the context of a hospital, a funeral or a hospital or something like that. A dead body just out in the world where you didn't expect it to be. So I could see how he could do something that wasn't the, the best to do or he could forget if he did something. I think it's a mistake that many people could make. Right. I see both things like maybe he was trying to preserve the crime scene, make sure that bird droppings and weird stuff didn't get in there before the police can arrive. Yeah. Or also it could have just been like, I don't want to see this anymore. It could just be something without even thinking, you know? Yeah. I don't see anything crazy about that. But another talk of the internet currently is Amy Price, the manager at the time. She was also interviewed and everyone found her to be a little quirky and a little too excited about this hotel. She loves this hotel. There are memes galore of this poor woman. We're going to share them. I love her. (laughs) So a lot of people are very, very angry at the fact that she called her mother before calling the police. And that is like one of the biggest repeating conversations that I'm seeing on all of these discussion boards and people, just random people that are watching the documentary because it's rated high on Netflix. Okay. Say you are in charge of this massive hotel that is two hotels and there has been a missing persons case and one of your employees has found the woman in the tank. And you understand immediately the ramifications of that. That means people, and she even says it, like people were bathing, drinking it, (laughs) brushing their teeth with it, right? Yeah. And also she likely was like, you know, getting a cup of water, washing her hands. She interacted with that water. Yeah. There had to be a certain amount of shock where like, I could see needing to call one of your parents to like level real quick. Have you ever had a really terrible thing happen to you? Of course. Okay, the first time you say it out loud is a different thing. (laughs) That's true. And yes, she was not the person who was murdered, but she was responsible for that hotel. And she was responsible for the people who drank that water. And she drank that water probably. Yeah, it was a lot. This was probably shocking and terrible for her too. And she probably needed a second to digest it. 
the person who she called was somebody who she could say, maybe not consciously, but I need to say this out loud for the first time and it not be to a police officer because you cannot fall apart. There is no time for it. So like you need to get your emotion out real quick and then move forward. That's how I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one one theory. That makes sense. But I think it's the wording that she used during the interview. I want to say she said something like, get ready or like prepare for what's to come. And people thought that was just a little weird. Oh, yeah. Why would she have to prepare? I don't know. I Again, I probably need to watch it again. I've watched it once and just watch kind of her body language a little bit more and how she says certain things. But there are a lot of body language experts right now that are dissecting everything she's doing, too. Of course. So it's just wild. It's crazy. And if you haven't watched the documentary yet, I do highly recommend it if you are interested in the Cecil Hotel at all. So we talked about Ditloff Pass some number of episodes ago. Who were we then? Different people. Different people. Younger people. But so first off, researchers think that they solved it. Which this isn't true crime, but it definitely it has to do with one of our episodes. So we're slipping it in the mystery surrounding it. And because people always thought that there was a human element, a possibility that they were murdered. Right. So it falls in there. Yeah. So John Gom and Alexander Puzin published results of their paper where they discussed that they think that it was a slab avalanche that caused the Ditloff Pass incident. And so they were inspired by watching Frozen. <laughs> Which I love. I never thought to to look at Elsa for help when solving a mystery. Typical Elsa behavior. Just very exciting, though. Like, I was like, oh, that's a cute little little something. But so a slab avalanche it occurs, quote, when chunks of snow sitting atop a weaker snow layer crack apart and slide downwards, often reaching speeds of about 80 miles per hour after six seconds. They account for the majority of avalanche-related deaths in North America, but are relatively small. And so what that makes me think of is a snowball. You know, like when it rolls down a hill, how it gets faster yeah. and bigger and faster and bigger. That's what it kind of like the cartoon version in my head thinks of. But I could absolutely see how, like, if a piece of snow goes sledding on another piece of snow, it can get fast and it can go fast, right? Yeah. And so Gom and Puzrin tested their theory by using a computer simulation of a slab avalanche. And they even met with Disney animators to talk to them about their process when it came to the animation. And he modified Disney's animation code and combined it with data from GM crash tests. Then he created a model of how it all could have been a slab avalanche. That's crazy. Also, I'll point out, if you've ever watched any like the behind the scenes Disney animation stuff. Yeah. How accurate they do a lot of this animation. And how they look at real life animals and watch their movements or yeah, how an avalanche or how snow would move when Elsa twirls it around. It's crazy how much detail they go into in a Disney movie. Yeah, I guess I never really thought about that. I was like, pretty snow, not like, is this physically possible when it comes to snow? Right. Because I'm not a snow scientist. I wouldn't know that looking at it. And so they think that there's a couple different factors, including how did the hikers set up their campsite area that kind of compound into this theory. Mm -hmm. But and it does account for some of the injury on the bodies. Amanda, you know, you don't like this. I know what haunts me. I don't like it. Do I love that Elsa's involved? Yes. Did I see Elsa ever pull out anybody's tongue and eyes? No. So therefore, (laughs) it's hard for me still like to think that's how that worked. I know that people say it was animals. But then why not all of the bodies? Because they were probably in the path of those animals. The animals had places to go and they just found those two. Look, the white rabbit can't be that late. See that other little Disney reference? But now I'm just picturing a rabbit eating somebody's tongue. See what I did to myself? I don't think they do that. They don't do that. I don't think they do. Not, not the not rabbits. But they think the reason why they undressed was paradoxical undressing due to hypothermia, which is when you take off your clothes because you feel hot. Yeah because you're dying of hypothermia. So fascinating. But there was also another interesting little hmm, with Ditloff Pass. Yeah. So when I was first reading about it, this wasn't solved yet. The, the next little piece of information I'll give you. But as of last night, I was able to find the outcome. So there was another close call for some hikers in the area. Don't go hiking there. And I was like, <laughs> not again. Yeah, stop going there. It's cursed. But anyways, a group of eight tourists from Moscow went missing in February and they were in the same area. And basically they were there to pay tribute to the original hikers. And they were supposed to return on February 10th, but never showed up, never checked in. Just real quick, Amanda, if I ever die, if I ever die a gruesome death in the woods, 
don't come pay tribute where I died my gruesome death in the woods, please. But nope, don't do it. But we have to. We have to line the area with Furbies. <laughs> you, oh, you mean you need to make a shrine? Yeah. <laughs> Who else is going to do this? No, you'll plant the Furbies. They will grow into, into Furby trees. Furby trees that you will then use to make <laughs> your eyes. <laughs> the true creeps guide stones. <laughs> <laughs> and this will all make sense in a few weeks guys <laughs> so they didn't show up when they were supposed to which sounds very familiar and in a couple of the articles about the new missing hikers they mentioned that the group did not officially register with the proper channels when they went hiking in the area so the ministry of emergency situations said that there were an amazing name sorry Right. That there were only three registered group in the Dyatlov Pass area at that time, leaving the missing group unaccounted for. They also said if the group is not registered, then there have been no reports of missing people. That's not how that works. It's not Schrodinger's cat. (laughs) If we don't know they're missing, they're not missing. Right, right. Well, luckily, a day after all of this happened, the group was finally tracked down and safe. But the reason why they were behind schedule is because they encountered severe weather and got set back. I wonder if they were like, ah! like freaking out. I would be. Yeah. I mean, I'd be like, this is what happened to them. I'm going to freeze. Maybe some ghosties helped them. Uh, maybe for the fire yeti. I made myself sad. Maybe that fire yeti warmed them up. There you go. Oh, we haven't talked about fire yeti in a minute. Yeah. Your favorite. It's one of my faves. So, I mean, that one had a very happy ending, but also I'm like, why does anyone want to go to there? Do not do that. I don't want to go to there. It is too cold. Unless you're going to line it with Furbies. Please don't do that either. That's disrespectful. <laughs> line your place of death with Furbies? No, anyone. Mine's fine. Actually, my tombstone needs to be a 3D Furby. Okay. Oh, my poor. I don't have children, but one day if I do, my poor children, <laughs> they'll come to, <laughs> to visit their mother, their mama, as they would say in Bridgerton. And have you watched that, by the way? Not yet, no. Please do. Please do. And then they'll just weep over a Furby. Makes sense. So if you missed it on Instagram, I am right now looking at the mystery package that Amanda mentioned that she sent to me during our Haunted Dolls episode. It is a Furby. His name is Tiger. He has little tiger stripes and a black mohawk. And most importantly, he has black eyes. Like a black eyed kid. And his mouth is like just parted, like just so. He's not like a working one. He's a Funko Pop. Yeah. But he is perfect and he sits on my desk and I love him. When I <laughs> got the package, Ben was like, you must, did you order something again? And I was like, probably. Mm-hmm. I knew it would make it into your house without you looking first. It, it did. It got into my damn house. And so he brought it in and I opened it and I was like, <gasps> and like when I like, I like caught a glimpse of for the word Furby. And then I like, was like, because I run down the stairs like an elephant at all times. There's no sneaking up on my husband. I'm like, dun, 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 dun. and I like run down and he's playing a video game. And I'm like, I don't get what you're doing. Look what I'm doing. And then I was like Marco pulling Amanda while opening and screaming it. And I love it. But also on another side note, two things. The first is that many people have asked about Ben's ventriloquist doll. (laughs) His name is Mortimer Snurd. Mortimer's a good name. That's a name for sure. If your name is Mortimer, all the best to you. But if you're a ventriloquist doll named Mortimer Snurd, go away. Okay. He was like, maybe I'll ask my mom if she's still in the house. Oh, no. But no, no. The day before he asked that, I said to him, I have two Hot Pockets. Both are warm. If I deliver unto you a prepared Hot Pocket, do you agree to never bring a haunted object into this house? And I am the determining factor of what a haunted object is. And he said, yes. And he took my Hot Pocket. And we have a valid contract. That is a contract. Yes. It is a contract. So he is no longer allowed to bring haunted objects in. Not that he was before, but it was in preparation for him thinking like, maybe bringing Mortimer in would be a good idea. And then he was like, I'll just put it in your car. Oh, he hadn't listened to the episode yet. He didn't even hear me talking about me haunting my car. (laughs) He didn't even know. He was just like, she'll never know. But we did have to slip in just I know we're talking true crime, but I had to slip in a Mortimer Snurd update as well. That's fair. I just, I said it was kind of an episode update in general. So I think that works. Yeah. But what I was going to ask, too, when you started to say that he was going to ask about the doll, mm-hmm. I was expecting his mother to say, actually, I thought it was in this room and it's no longer here. No, no, no. no I think it would be like in storage. No, it's a new mystery. It's gone. It walked away. 
like Teddy Ruxpin, which I found. In that thrift store. Both of them. In the thrift store. Yeah. A week apart. Highly alarming. Yeah. It was a sign. Okay. So, couple other updates, and they pertain to the Lori Vallow case. So, this last month, there were a decent amount of court documents that were filed. An interesting hearing took place. Emma Daybell Murray, which is Chad Daybell's daughter, had an interesting interview with Court TV about her mother's autopsy. And another thing a lot of people are talking about are Mark Means tweets. Love it. And to recap, where we left off in our Sinister Love, Fallow, and Daybell episode was Tammy Daybell's autopsy results were being released to the Fremont Sheriff's Department. And so as we continue, we'll pick up up on that. Yeah. So Mark Means, which is Lori's attorney, and he's at Means Law on Twitter, had a few tweets on February 4th that set a lot of people off, including myself, because I thought one of them was just absolutely ridiculous. And it goes into Tammy's autopsy. He talks about the investigation. He talks about the Fremont County elected coroner ruled her, Tammy, her death caused by natural causes. And I'm like, okay, but there wasn't an autopsy done. And so it's it's strange to me that an attorney would go on Twitter and tweet a bunch of things about a case that he's working on. I know this day and age, social media is important, but also... What is he doing? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say that I find it the most professional way to get the word out about his client. However, he can't be silent, right? So there's like everyone who thinks Lori and Chad did it saying many things. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't say anything, it would seem weird. And at this point, their jury pool is still in Fremont County. So he has to kind of start his case now. It's it's not the official way you do things, but he doesn't know if his case is going to be in Fremont County right now. So he has to start saying like some things are going on that are strange if he thinks it. And he also likely, I would imagine he talked to Lori about this. Like, I can't imagine that he would just fly off the handle or, you know, maybe she doesn't care. Yeah, he talks about a number of different things happening in the the case currently, including like the client communications and, and things like that, right? So it's like everything that he's been arguing for a while. And then also, again, the Tammy Daybell thing. I don't understand if, if there wasn't an autopsy done originally and he really truly thinks he has nothing to worry. Well, I mean, I don't think he thinks this, but why would you be afraid of an autopsy? Because if anything, if no one did anything wrong, it would clear your client. But anyways, that's just my opinion. It's also that the, the autopsy isn't relative to the case at hand, right? Like what, what Laurie's been charged with has nothing to do with Tammy. So, well, maybe there'd be murder charges added because they have that combined. But right now there's not. He calls it a media teaser, which I'm not saying it's not. Like acting as though maybe there was something nefarious to a potential jury pool for unrelated offenses is a little bit concerning because think about it. Say she did die of natural causes. And we'll talk a little bit in a little bit why maybe that is the case because there's other information we've learned. But say she died of natural causes. And what they said is, you know what? This is, you know, speculation. But they're like, you know, if we release that the autopsy is done, but we're not releasing it to the public, it seems as the absence of information makes people fill in the blanks. That's true. And so this jury pool is now going to be like, I'm not saying anybody's going to find them not guilty for JJ entirely, but they could be biased by this other issue. No, that's absolutely true. But also when you're saying like the jury pool, right? We don't know who the jury pool is going to be quite yet. We don't know where they're going to be. We don't know where they're going to come from. Nothing. Putting all of this into the world even more, though, you would think that he wouldn't be doing that because he wants a non-biased jury pool. And these tweets make me go, huh, what is he talking about? Like, if I wasn't familiar with him and I saw people retweeting this... I would be like, what does he mean? I honestly think that unless they're sequestered from like two years ago on in preparation for this case, it's hard to have a non-biased jury pool. It is. I think it's going to be hard to get enough people who don't have serious opinions about this case in Fremont County. Yeah. But so let's continue on. Amanda mentioned some court filings. Yes. There were 12 filings in February in relation to this case. We are not going to go through all of them. That would be boring to you. And frankly, you would just start to tune my voice out. We're going to talk about them in broad strokes. There were five different types of filings. The first was request for approval to record or broadcast the case. That's exactly what it sounds like it is. Second is, and these aren't necessarily chronological order. It's just kind of like 
what happened, what happened. And as we get further down, it's because I have more things to say about it. (laughs) So second is there was an order denying the defense's motion for reconsideration of the court's decision to not remove Rob Wood from this case. And as you'll remember, there were motions filed to disqualify Rob Wood because they said he had had communications with witnesses that right they were denied. Right. And they were denied. Yeah. The defense was like, are you sure? And the judge was like, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah. And then so next Mark's means filed an expert witness disclosure and the name of their expert witness is Ironwood Insights. So I had to look up what they are. Right. Of course. And they're a market research and analysis firm who one of their specialties is they work on cases where the defense is seeking a change of venue. Mm hmm. It's very specific. Yeah. And one of the testimonials from their website is from Dr. Nicole Hamilton, and he's a jury consultant slash expert. And this is what he had to say. I have partnered with the Ironwood team for over 10 years and consider their contributions vital in the change of venue surveys in capital cases. Capital cases. Yes. This is not a capital case yet. Yet. So let's point that out. And then Ironwood's research consultation, their administration of the telephone surveys, the quality of their data they provide, and their assistance in presenting the results in a court of law are all paramount to my success as a jury expert. I find that fascinating. To me, that makes me think they're gearing up for capital charges. Also, I looked at their website on their hiring section because to me, this all sounds very expensive. Yeah. For sure. Right. This sounds like a very expensive thing. And I was looking on (laughs) their job postings to see if I could see how much they paid people. And one of the things that I found was that they had like a survey person. And some of the people who take surveys are 16 years old. Like you have to be 16 years or older. And I was like, that feels very young to be asking questions about a capital murder case. But who am I? But interesting. They're those people at the malls. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. You, You know, I did that, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was my first job. Interesting. That's the story for another day. So. Some of the other filings related to Laurie and her attorney, Mark Means, inability to regularly communicate as they should be able to. So Means cited that he has been denied the use of the client attorney room at the jail and that their telephone conversations have been recorded. He also requested that Laurie be granted a cell phone, which would be locked so it could only call him. We'll cover more on this when we talk about the February 17th hearings, but it's definitely an interesting point. These filings aren't the sexy filings. No. I'm just going to be real with it. They're not sexy filings, but they're the filings that if they're ignored and they're not carefully considered, will get Laurie off later on a motion to dismiss or an appeal on a motion to dismiss that's denied. So they're not sexy, but they're part of the sausage that's integral <laughs> to our justice system. Yeah, it makes sense. And a lot of people don't understand what they mean because it is a lot of law jargon, right? When you're reading one. Yeah. I know me personally, I have to read them a couple times to get every specific detail out of one. So the summaries are great. Also, guys, I'm a bar attorney. I don't practice criminal law, but I'm formally trained on reading court documents. (laughs) So... (laughs) Continuing on. So the last type of filings are filings pertaining to a motion to compel that sought witness statements that had not yet been provided to the defense. And so in the hearings, it's real nitty gritty. They talk about the specific rules of law. It's intense. But basically, the defense was seeking all evidence pertaining to communications between the prosecutor and any witnesses that will be called at trial. Rob Wood, in his reply filings, talks about it being overbroad. He also cites that it's work product and that it wouldn't be evidence that he will be required to disclose. And basically, work product doctrine is like evidence that wouldn't be required to be disclosed because it's a work product is when it's legal research of records that someone did that the other team could do. Right. Like say you were looking at land records and I pull land records. I don't have to give those to you because they're available. Yeah. Right. They're also correspondence and reports or memos that include opinions, theories or conclusions drawn by the prosecuting attorneys or their staff. So, you know, say, I don't know, on the trial of Miss Piggy, the prosecution is like, I think that she did it because of this, 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 this. And that's scribbled on like a witness's like written statement. Yeah. I don't think that anybody would do that. It seems like bad organization on my part, but they wouldn't be required to hand over their own notes. So we'll talk more about that in the hearings. But Means also argues that he did not receive evidence that had been supplied to John Pryor, who's Chad's counsel, which would be problematic. The filings are a little bit of a bickering back and forth. Yeah. You're doing this. You're not doing this. You're doing this. I did this. You did this. So it's a little bit back and forth. Okay. So we're going to talk about the hearings. But the way that I wanted to bring up just a few things first, Amanda and I both watch the hearings through East Idaho's News' live stream on Facebook, Mm -hmm. which means that there's a comment section. Yes. 
interesting comments section. Interesting comment section. And so I'm going to tell you some of the comments and I'm going to explain some of it as we talk about the hearings. A lot of people have questions. Yes. So as we said before, this is not the sexy hearings. This is the minutia, the you didn't give me a hard drive. I didn't get to meet with her three times a week. I got to meet with her two times a week. That's not an exact quote, but I'm saying like it's the details. Right. And these are so important because that's what the law is to a certain extent. That's what the practice of law is. It's little by little by little making your case, right? In my opinion. So here are some of the questions that I saw. Why is this more important than justice for the kids? You have to get to there. Why does Wood have to disclose his case? Isn't it up to each attorney to do the legwork? And then so last two are just comments. Mm -hmm. And these are all quotes, by the way. She killed her kids. She should lose all rights and privileges. Is she guilty? What is she so worried about? That was in reference to her phone calls being recorded. So I want to preface this. Our legal system is an imperfect system, and oftentimes it can be incorrectly applied, and there's bias that can, I mean, especially when we're talking about marginalized communities, where we know that there's bias implicit in the court system. But the way our court system should run is that you are innocent until proven guilty. And I personally do believe that Chad and Lori are guilty. However, with every ounce of my being, I think that they are entitled to a fair and just court case. And taking all of the minutia seriously means that one, they get that fair and just court case that is a cornerstone of our society and how America works. And if the justice system did work perfectly, I think our court system would be one of the shining pillars of our nation. Like I truly so thoroughly believe that. So it's not that all like whether Lori Vallow has a cell phone is more important than justice for Tylee and JJ. No. But here's the other thing is that if this isn't done and this isn't all done right and by the book and perfectly, this is how people get off on technicalities so that you want to make sure the sausage is like perfectly made because otherwise this is how people get away with murder. Right. And one thing during the hearing that you had mentioned to me that I didn't notice the first time and you noticed it was the way that Mark Means phrases certain things. Oh, yeah, we'll get to that, too. I'm I'm excited. I'm high on legal proceedings. (laughs) Yeah, because I would like to think I'm average, maybe a little above average for how many court cases I've watched in the past. But even with that, I will miss little things. So it's really good when I'm watching it to be able to go, hey, Lindsay, what did they mean by this? Or why would he say it this way? Or she's like, oh, my gosh, did you catch this? He said this in this certain phrasing. It means it's coming back later. So even though these aren't the most, in my opinion, interesting, like you said, they're not the sexy hearings yet, they can and probably will come back to bite us later. So it's good to have this knowledge now. Yeah. So second question was, why does Wood have to disclose this case? It's up to each attorney to do the legwork. I mean, that's what you would hope. But I mean, when you think of like the workload, you know, like to the average person, you're like, well, if I have to do work, you have to do work, right? But it's not like that. For sure. (laughs) But also, I want you to think about like the best crime dramas you watch, right? The prosecution's (laughs) talking and then they go, and I have another witness. And everyone goes, yeah. And they walk in the room and someone comes in and they walk in perfectly timed. Like, how do they know there's no speakers outside? They're supposed to be dead for some reason. Yeah, they're supposed to be dead. And they're like, and I have this other evidence. Ha And like, they have a witness <laughs> and a piece of evidence. And that's not how this works. No, not at all. If you have evidence that would prove the innocence of the defendant, you must share it. Mm-hmm. Point blank. If you have evidence relevant to the case... You must share it with the other side, period. Mm -hmm. And that's something that fascinated me that people didn't understand. Yeah. Because in my head, I'm like, yeah, like they have to. Everyone has to be on the same page when it comes to this. There aren't really any big surprises. When you get to the actual trial, it should be boring, which sounds strange because we see so many crime dramas, but it should be boring. There should be no surprises. It should be boring to them. To us, it's still going to be interesting because we don't have all of that yet. Yes, yes, yes. That's true. Like <laughs> It should be that you know everything that the other side's going to say. Yeah. Now, that being said, right, like your opening statement can be jarring and heartfelt and all of the things and hit you, right? And your closing statement is going to do the same thing. And that might be surprising how they phrase that. But when it comes to the state's case against the defendant, the defendant absolutely needs to know everything the state has against them and vice versa, right? Like say, I don't know, Miss, we're talking Miss Piggy's case again, and they have a piece of evidence that proves that she was in Baltimore, Maryland 
on the date that they said that she killed Kermit the Frog. And they're like, we're going to wait till trial, right? That's not how that works. And there are many evidence rules. They are very intricate. Again, I don't practice criminal law. Again, this is my speculation and reading of this. But generally, it's all going to be shared. So it's not one person being lazy. It's saying, we need the statements that you took to figure out why you think she has perpetrated this crime in order to build an adequate defense. So let's talk about the two major themes of these hearings. The first was a discovery request we talked about a few minutes ago that that the prosecution had deemed overbroad. Again, they were seeking all communications between the prosecution and witnesses who would be called at trial. Judge Boyce ruled that all written statements must be provided to the defense. Any verbal statements must be summarized, then provided to the defense. So that's not surprising to me, but we'll move on. The second was whether Laurie should be entitled to the use of a cell phone while she is awaiting trial so that she may assist in the preparation of her defense. Also, Means brought up the possibility of turning off recording devices and the availability of the client attorney room for his and Laurie's use. So Mark Means argued that he had been denied privileged access to his client due to COVID-19. And we've talked with this before that like, everything's different. To be the person like planning how everything has to work in a prison and or jail yeah, during this time, while trying to not violate anybody's constitutional rights. But keep people safe at the same time? Yeah. I don't want to be that person. A heavy, heavy task. So John Pryor has not had any issues meeting with Chad. Means suggested that there might be gender discrimination, which that's a heavy accusation to just throw around. And so Means said that he was not allowed to use the attorney-client room within the jail and that the phone calls were recorded. Yeah, and I believe what he's referring to is at the beginning of our COVID era, the policies and everything weren't streamlined yet is the best way I can say it. And there was a conversation that had been recorded and found. And from what we've all heard, it was immediately deleted. And so I have not seen that it's happened since, but I see both sides of it. You know, a pandemic happened. No one knew what to do. Everyone was just trying to make the right choices. Yeah. And from what I understand, he made the right choice once and said, do not record this. And they turned it off. But then it happened where he didn't mention it to them. And I see both sides as the Those conversations should not be recorded, but also it wasn't like a prepared thing because of a pandemic. Yeah. I also saw where she's allowed to call her attorney, but there was jail staff very close who could overhear her because they were monitoring her use of a phone in an office. It makes sense, but it also doesn't make sense. So Means also alleged that the jail's refusal to let him meet with Laurie coincided with motions that would displease Wood. Which feels like a very serious accusation against Wood. And when they discuss Wood during this hearing, one of the things that they kind of, it's the theme of this. When Pryor talks, he is red-faced and passionate when he speaks. He's like very intense. I think he's like that anyways. He seemed extra passionate. Perhaps that's who he is. No, I mean, I'm just having a little jab at him because he just comes off as insensitive and brusque. Is that a word? Raging? Yeah. I don't know what how to describe him. But he sat there most of the hearing, like with the most angry, bored face. I, mm-hmm. I don't know if those two even coincide together, but that's the best way I could describe him. Yeah, it was also interesting because when they were on break, he like answered his cell phone and didn't mute himself. And I was like, dude, we're fresh off of I'm here live. I'm not a cat. Like, you know better. Like, you got to have your Zoom on mute, my dude. It's my favorite video of all time. As it should be. But so Mean said that he would be filing a motion to dismiss if he is denied access to his client because, quote, it would be impossible to prepare an adequate defense. And that's one of these things that we're going to hear in a few months. Like, if this isn't remedied, this will be the next step. Understandably so. You should have access to your client. That's part of our justice system. Yeah. It should work, right? It doesn't seem like it should be fair because a lot of us have that bias towards her and believe that she is guilty. Yeah. But we need to do it in a fair manner. Mm -hmm. And because if we're not doing it fair, then the whole thing can get thrown out. And we don't want to do this wrong. So interestingly, Mean said that he once spoke with Wood regarding the issue about not being able to see Laurie. And Wood called the jail to make sure Means was able to meet with Laurie. So it seems like he's like kind of like going back and forth. He's like, Wood know about Wood knew about this, but I also think that he's like colluding with the jail for me to not be able to see my client. Right. And so 
Wood did not object to Mean and Laurie's use of the client attorney room. Because what does that have to do? Like, that doesn't make his case any better. It just makes it more fair on both sides. Yeah, exactly. And so he was like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I didn't know this was an ongoing problem. And when I did, I tried to help you, my dude. But OK. Imagine him talking like that. I hope he did. I hope he was like, my dude. He, I mean, I say I hope he did. He wasn't like that. But I hope that in his brain, that's how he was thinking it. But he did understandably object to Laurie getting a cell phone, <laughs> even if it was locked. Because the idea is it's like it's locked and the only person she can call is him. But like he can call someone else. You know what I mean? Like he could always be like, here's this person. And you never know what exists out in the world. You know, like you never know. Exactly. So Judge Boyce, not surprisingly, denied the cell phone request and stated that he would not be issuing an order for a means to be able to meet with Laurie because it wasn't necessary given current jail policies. He talked about the fact that that's not his place because they make their policies based on what is best for everyone in the jail. Right. Not one person. And that's fair. And it's fair. And so he was like, you shouldn't be being denied if, if that's not the policy. He's like, I'm not going to rule that they should be doing this thing that they should be doing. Because it's kind of like a moot point, it feels like, right? He also said that he wouldn't be issuing an order for a change in security camera recording. Of course, they're not going to turn security cameras off. No. I understand like why he was like, they can read lips. Yes, but safety is also important. You have to balance, right? Yeah. So one of the biggest critiques the defense has against Rob Wood is that he has personally inserted himself in this case and that his communication style has been less than professional. And so it seemed interesting that Wood was so against sharing communications between himself and witnesses. Right. They were late. Yeah, they were late. And that feels strange to me. Now, I'll say it for the third time, I don't practice criminal law. Maybe that's really typical. I've never seen that. And it rang a little strange. He was like, what are you hiding? That felt weird to me that he was like, oh, I, I everything. <laughs> He's, they're like, yeah, if you're talking to witnesses, we should see what you say. Well, and one thing that I've read about that, too, is these people that are involved as attorneys and prosecutors and all of that fun stuff. This is not their typical case from what I understand. This is insane, right? Yeah. Especially the prosecution right there in this little area in Idaho. Yeah. Where there's not a lot of crimes. There's not a lot of crazy things that happen. There were interviews done on one of the, I don't know if it was on Dateline or one of those episodes where they're like, there's no crime here. Yeah. Like the worst crime that's happened in Rexburg was like the water tower was graffitied once. Yeah, this is a big deal. And it's probably out of their norm. And some of it might be they're trying to react to what is coming from this. And I don't know if that's the case. It's just thinking about it from the small little Rexburg area or yeah. little Idaho town going through something so crazy that's worldwide. People worldwide are talking about this case. One more thing. One of the things that means argued was he was like, she should be able to talk to me and work on her defense especially in a case with this much media coverage, which that is not how this works. That's not how any of this works. All cases are the same. All of these cases. You should all have access to your attorneys. And that was the problem with the cell phone request, right? It's like, what are they going to issue them to every person in the jail? No. Therefore, it has to be a one size fits all approach. Right. Now, this is a very complex case. It is more complex than most of the other people who are awaiting trial. OK, maybe, maybe I'm listening. I'm listening. Go on. Go on for that area. Yeah, that's fair. That is an argument that I could get behind is that if everybody is given equal amount of time for use in that room, somebody who has a relatively more straightforward case having equal time as this case, that doesn't seem fair because there's more to prepare for. I mean, you could flip that around, though, like because someone is might have, I'm not going to say did, but might have done something because they're innocent until proven guilty, something more extreme, then are they going to go, well, I could have done this like to get more time. I'm just saying it's all fair or not fair. You know, like there's it's hard to distinguish. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know the solution. I'm just saying it's a mess. Yeah. And it would be a shame if this has some type of procedural effect in the future. OK, I have ranted about court cases long enough. Amanda, would you like to talk about Emma Daybell Murray's interview with Court TV? Yes. So Emma, again, is Chad and Tammy's daughter, right? 
And Court TV, I, I have a love-hate relationship with Court TV because some of the things that they say, it's like, realistically, she gave us five minutes of information, but they're like, life-changing interviews and like all, all the stuff surrounding this. I'm like, right? I didn't find it as crazy as they made it out to be. <laughs> we had what, like five bullet points? I was like, this was a tweet. Yeah, yeah. So basically, one of their reporters spoke with Emma over the phone and asked her a couple different questions in regards to her mother's autopsy, which is fair, right? We want to know what's going on. Have they seen the autopsy, her family, her siblings, any of Tammy's living relatives, right? The answer is no. So just to summarize it, and honestly, I do think it's something that people should probably listen to just to get her tone and, and what she's feeling, because you do feel a lot of it in her voice. Yeah, it hurt my heart to hear her. I do want to say there are reports of her acting silly at the beginning of this whole case. And there's been rumors in regards to like her and her husband. There's some that they might have taken down the tribute to Tylee and JJ. I don't know one way or the other. But also, they did not make these choices that Chad and Lori did. So it kind of sucks that their lives have changed, right? Like their lives have been just stress and fear and sadness for a long time. Yeah. Emma lost her mom and then her dad went to jail. And she even says that, right? Like, I was like, ooh, it didn't even occur to me, which made me sad that it didn't even occur to me. But it didn't occur to me that she lost both of her parents very, very quickly. Right, right. So again, I feel for her. I don't know how much she knew. I would hope that he kept them out of the loop, right? Yeah. But anyways, so what they were asking about was Tammy's autopsy. And basically what she says is, no, we haven't seen it. None of my family's seen it. And what they wanted them to do was to have a meeting with detectives. What I understand is they didn't directly say, no, you may not see it. They gave her some guidelines as to how to view the autopsy. Yeah. And a lot of people are kind of bickering over, are these okay to put the family through to share something so private as their mother's autopsy? Or because it is such a big case and a lot hinges on this autopsy, is it fair to make them kind of jump through hoops in order to see the autopsy? Right? And that, again, that's a summary. That's a summary. I'm surprised they were even willing to let them see it, honestly. Yeah. And she also goes in to say that when her mother was exhumed, it sounds like they weren't aware yeah, they found it out in the news, right? Yeah. So she says, this is a quote from Emma that I had written out. What she said was, I don't think this is common knowledge that the Fremont County Sheriff's Office reported the exhumation of my mother's body in December of 2019, two weeks after the fact, through a public press release from the Rexburg Police Department in a city from a different county. They did not sit us down or anything and prepare us or let us know what was going on. We found out that our mother had been exhumed and we had no idea. Okay. Yeah. The thing is, all right, I'm trying to think back. So, so December of 2019, here's the thing. Her father and Lori were still out there, right? Mm -hmm. And so if they still had ties to this, if he had known at that time, maybe things could have changed. Maybe they could have went into a better hiding. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't tell the family. I think that's what's hard is that it sounds and it feels wrong that someone would have to find out such heartbreaking news at the same time the rest of the world does. And I'm, I'm not going to say that that's not true. Right. But in the same respect... How do you balance the need for secrecy in a case while you're still building it and understanding it? And, you know, not jumping the gun and say, you know, say they were like, hey, we're going to exhume the body and they told them. What if they would have told Chad? Like, just like you said, like, what if they would have told Chad and then he got rid of evidence, moved evidence? Here's the thing, though. It did become public, right? So like everyone knew at the same time. I don't know if that would have changed things had he heard earlier. I don't know. But I do know that Alex Cox died right after. Yeah, that's what I found very suspicious was she was exhumed, then Alex Cox died. Yeah. I will say, like, there's that sweet spot in the middle where the public doesn't know yet, but the thing has already happened, and that's when the family should have been notified. That's, that's that moment in the middle. Right. But who knows how long that exists, right? Yeah. Maybe somebody who works at some media outlet reached out to somebody who works at the graveyard and said, like, hey... Let me know when this thing happens, because it's going to. Right. And it's just hard to not think of the next day. You know, like her body, I want to say, was exhumed on December 11th. And then Alex Cox died the following day. So our minds go, what? 
But then when when we hear Emma talk about how they didn't even know, did he know that she was exhumed? Because in my mind, when I first heard it was they knew she was exhumed. Something happened to Alex the next day. But if no one knew, maybe it takes away some of that thought that I had prior. That's true. That didn't occur to me. But the thing is where she was exhumed, though, right? And again, this is speculation on my part. Maybe someone did let it slip to the people in that area. I don't know. Well, and also, like, that's where her family was from. Right. So the reporter also asked Emma, I'm sure you have feelings of what it says, it being the autopsy. And Emma says, I have a pretty good idea. This whole situation. I was shook, by the way. Yeah. Shook. This whole situation is heartbreaking. And I'm like, I want to know what she thinks. And then Emma says there's a lot of false information circulating in the news, right, about her mother's passing. And then when the reporter tried to like follow up and go like, what? And she's like, I'm not going to say that right now. I'm curious what the autopsy results are first. So it's like, you want to say it's false information. But then like, to me, that sounds like a tinge of doubt. Yeah. Well, to me, that sounds like. Did they find out? (laughs) No, not that. It sounds like Lori knew Chad a, a brief period of time and then her children were buried in his backyard. Could you imagine a lifetime living with him? You would believe him. You would be easily manipulated by him. It might not feel like manipulation to her, but like they talk, you're going to talk about in the hearing in a moment, but like they they talk about like, he was like, oh, she was sick. She wasn't feeling well, like X, Y, Z. And if he had been telling that to his kids for weeks before, I'm not saying there's, this is me speculating. If he had been telling his kids every once in a while, like, Your mom's not feeling good again. Think about like that, that little of a statement said multiple times in every conversation throughout the three months preceding her death. Right. How that would make you feel like, yeah, she hasn't felt well for months. And he's like, she doesn't want to talk about it because she won't go to the doctor. Could you hear it? Like, it's like soft, like, uh, ooh, ooh. It's your dad, too. It's it's your dad. And like, you have no reason to distrust him. And him and your mom were high school sweethearts and all the things. I could see how if this was my dad and I knew him to be one person my entire life. This might be really hard for me to think any other way. Yeah, absolutely. So once the phone call ended with Emma, what Lindsay's referring to, Court TV played the conversation that Melanie Gibb had recorded. And I want to say I talked about it on our Valo episode, but she had recorded a conversation with Chad and Lori and played it to the court. And that's where Chad goes on about how she had been sick for a long time and mentions Tammy's sister. And it's interesting to hear him talk about Tammy, even though I've heard that before, but to like put it with a conversation about her autopsy now, I guess, just made it real. He also said he'd known that she would die young. Oh, yeah. He's mentioned that several times that he knew that. I don't like that. Could you imagine your spouse saying that to you? I'd be like, oh, am I? Am I? Right? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I would be like sleeping with one eye open. What I thought was interesting is, yeah, where they, they picked the part in the recorded conversation from the court where basically he mentioned that Tammy had been getting weaker and sick. He begged her to go to the doctor. Her heart was failing her. And I'm sorry, like sickness and heart issues. How do you know it was her heart failing her? How do you know it wasn't just A, B or C? I guess me just thinking it through. I think that if that was the case, one of her family members, any of her family members would have come out and been like, she's been suffering from this for years. She has like, right, insert heart disease that makes this a reasonable thing that happened. Right. I'm sure someone would have said something. Anyone would have said something. People around her said that she was fine the last time they Mm -hmm. had seen her. But when I went into Rexburg and I interviewed a couple people, the ones that I interviewed didn't know her personally, but they knew people that knew her. Right. So it's kind of like playing a game of telephone. Yeah. Do I know for sure? Who knows? Because they could have been lied to for all I know. I don't know. But a lot of people had mentioned to these people that I talked to that she was fine, that they had seen her, you know, X amount of days before her passing or in the news. People were talking about how she was training for some sort of physical activity or run. But anyways, so it continues. Chad said this. She just passed away. My son Garth was right there with me the whole time and the kids were there within 20 minutes of her passing. It's just still weird to me. She was young, died in her sleep. If it were one of my family members at her exact place in life that died in their sleep, I would be like not questioning my father, right? Like like you said, you grew up with your father, you trust your father, you trust your family. 
But what happened to her? Why did she die? Is it genetic? Is it something that I could have? Is it something my kids could have? Is it something my cousins, you know, like there's, yes, there's a level of, can I prepare for this too, for the rest of my family or for me? So I don't do this to others that I love. And I don't want to make it sound selfish, but it's more also just like the peace of mind. If it is like something happened, her heart stopped. Okay, at least I have that in the back of my head that I couldn't do anything to prevent it. Yeah, that's just my feelings towards it. If one of my loved ones passed away and it's just strange to me that they didn't push for the autopsy to begin with. Yes, that's why my speculation is heartily in long game manipulation. Yeah. So we'll see what comes of this. Again, we are recording this part on February 24th. So things could change a couple hours from now. Who could know? So in the the next hearing for Laurie and Chad is on March 22nd. And so we'll obviously include more updates in our next True Crime Digest, but we'll also talk about that hearing as well. Yeah. So another just big true crime topic that's been happening this past week was the identity of Valentine Sally. And I'm in Arizona, so this has been like a mystery that I've seen come up often. And it's a 40-year-old mystery of an unidentified female that was found in 1982 on Valentine's Day, and she was never claimed, right? Well, I'll get into it. But as of a couple of weeks ago, we still didn't know who she was, right? So she was found by a DPS officer on Interstate 40, about 11 miles west of Williams in 1982. They believed her to be about 16 to 23 years old. They gave a good description of her. Unfortunately, animals had eaten a lot of her flesh from her face and her right ear. And due to that, on top of decomposition, it was very hard to identify who she was at that time. The area that she was found in was known for truck drivers to stop at and cool their brakes. So a lot of people thought truck driver might have done it. Yeah. But again, we didn't know who she was. So it it was just all up in the air. It was a big mystery. She was misidentified at one time, too, which I found very interesting. She was misidentified as Melody Cutlip. And later, Melody Cutlip, who was a runaway at the time, came home. So they were able to go, oh, it's not Melody, right? And there was even a gravestone at that point, right? Yeah. Unsettling. So Melody's family, they never confirmed like, yep, that's her. We'd like the body back. They said, no, that's probably not her. And everyone at the time was like, it's just they don't want it to be her. Yeah. But no, it wasn't her. So once Melody came home, they again, they called her Sally Valentine because they didn't know who she was and she was found on Valentine's Day. Her body was exhumed to x-ray her skull and her DNA was entered into CODIS. But unfortunately, it didn't match anyone at that time, right? So from the 80s until February of 2021, finally, detectives were working with the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, or NamUs, as Lindsay has talked about several times, and the Arizona Department of Public Safety to identify her through familial DNA. And basically what they did is they utilized a private company that specializes in DNA processing. And they put it into online databases for genetic comparison. And then what they did is they took that data to search for people that could possibly be related to her. And they were able to find potential family members. Then from there, they got samples. And then they were able to confirm and it was indeed a missing family member from back then. She ended up being identified as Carolyn Eaton. And her relatives were in Missouri. Woof. Which is very far from Arizona. Yeah. But I guess they had a sister that had run away around Christmas time and then never heard of her again. And it breaks my heart. But then I'm also happy that they finally got the closure. Yeah. And this case that has been misidentified and has been kind of the talk of Arizona. It comes up almost every Valentine's Day. I see something on it. Yeah. So she's still buried in Arizona, too. So she's up in Williams area. Her gravestone, from what I understand, I couldn't find a a current picture of it, but it still has Melody's name and it also still has Sally Valentine. But I'm assuming that'll probably change. Yeah. And you mentioned that it reminded you of someone. Yeah, it reminds me of Michelle Garvey. And we're going to talk about her in our episode next week. But she's one of the victims from the Texas killing fields who went missing from one state and then shows up in another. And I think when you think about like that paired with a long time period, it hurts my heart so intensely for that family. Yeah. Because like, especially like when you're like, the remains were discovered relatively quickly, but then you're waiting like over a decade. And, you know, maybe you had hope or maybe you knew 
But either way, like you didn't have closure for that period of time. Yeah. And then on top of it, there's there's nothing you can do. Nope. And it's it's sad because now that we finally have her identity that everyone's been wondering for so, so long, there's still the question of who did it. Yeah. Right? So there's a cold case squad working on it. As of right this moment, there are no suspects. And that's just heartbreaking that whoever did this either got away with it completely, or maybe maybe they got imprisoned for another crime, but they've never had to face what they did to her. Yeah. I also, we don't have to keep this in, but that actually kind of sounds like an MO. It does. Doesn't it? Like pick up in one state and then you take them to another state to drop them very far away, teenage girl. Because we don't know what like what Michelle Garvey was doing. We don't know why she left her house. We just know that she did. So like the idea of like teenage girl, teenage girl, went missing from one state. Yeah ends up in another one, isn't identified for over a decade. Yeah. And there's a lot of talks of certain truck drivers that would have been in this area around that time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they said as more leads develop, they'll obviously be looking into them. Yeah. But it's so sad that it sat this long for her to even just have a name or the proper name. Yeah. But yes, like I said, every Valentine's Day, you see something. I'm in Arizona, so we see something about her. And it was just really cool that just a little while after Valentine's Day, we finally have a name to the face that we've seen on our timeline so many times. Yeah, that is also like a very, I'd never heard of that. Yeah. East Coast, baby. But I mean, it's interesting, like you hear regional, like there's different like regional cases that just like hit you. Yeah. And so that concludes our first episode of True Crime Digest. Very excited about this. Again, if you guys have cases that you want us to update on, let us know. Yeah. If we have enough of the same one, we'd love to do an episode on it and then keep following it. Yeah. And if you have any feedback about True Crime Digest that you want us to know, shoot us an email because we'd love to hear it and hopefully incorporate your thoughts. Yeah. And with that, we'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening. For more information on our sources, please visit our website, truecreeps.com. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can follow us on Instagram at True Creeps Pod, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash True Creeps Pod, and on Twitter at True Creeps. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps. <laughs>